And Nifty? Yeah. You don't even want to know what her deal is. Oh, ho, ho. you may know everyone else well, Kitty, but you do not know me. Box bites. You know, I often like to start these videos with some profound statement about a character's nuances and contributions to has -Been Hotel's bigger picture, but I'm not even gonna try that here. Nifty's just freaking weird, man. One minute she's obsessively scrubbing any spot her spindly arms can reach, the next she's not only showing Stain's mercy, but giving them freaking names. Now and spread. Sometimes she's kind, docile, and huggable like an innocent baby soft sweetheart. Then right before you can let your guard down, she's decked out in that and ready to whip male delinquents like they were creamy atop a Sunday whip. Now, from a writing standpoint, I get it. She's the chaos gremlin. She's the girl from Invader Zim. The character mainly used for non sequitur jokes and causing conflict. But even characters like Gur have explanations for why they behave so weirdly, giving us reasoning that makes metaphorical and literal sense. But with Nifty, we're stuck with zero major info even after eight episodes and a pilot. Or are we? When compiled together, are the small bits of character shown throughout has been enough to paint a clear picture of Nifty, her relationship with Alistair, her weird bug murder obsession, the time period in which she fell to the flames? All of these things might be slapping us in the face with facts that we could easily pick up on if we just saw things with a different eye. And that's what I'm gonna do today. So grab a brush and get on your knees as we clean up this seemingly hot mess of a character and reveal the potential tragic truth that lies underneath. Let's go! Let's start by nailing down everything that we know about Nifty. Well, she's a 22-year-old girl hailing from Japanese roots, according to Vivzi, and she died some time in the 1950s. The poodle skirt she wears in the pilot might also suggest that she immigrated to the United States with her family, as poodle skirts are distinctly a part of 1950s American fashion. She has a lot of the tendencies of a typical housewife, being very passionate about cooking, cleaning, sewing, and pest control, while often smiling and being very demure in most situations. But the more you see her in action, the more disturbing and demented she comes off as. She shows off sadistic glee when taking out bugs and rats around the hotel, intentionally killing the parental pests to send a message to their offspring while fashioning their corpses into puppets and crowns for her own use. Her desires to keep things neat, clean, tidy, and trim come off less as adorable quirks and more as conditioned obsessions. Like this kind of mindset was instilled in her for many years during her life. She's not exactly the sharpest needle in the sewing kit, as she often fails to read the room and sometimes even forgets what room she's in to begin with. She has a flaming passion for bad boys and goes absolutely mad when she sees one, with the desire to either force them into submission or act as the one who's being forced. She's also a huge masochist, to the point where a frag grenade to the face is probably her idea of a good night. And while her constant smiling face may give off the impression that she's often happy, do not let that fool you. She shows off that toothy grin even in situations where her feelings are anything but happy, as evident by the way her eyes emote. It's a similar case to Alistair, where a smile doesn't always indicate joy. Speaking of Alistair, the two seem to be very well acquainted. She arrives in the hotel upon Alistair's command and immediately starts doing what she does best. Now, it's unclear if Alistair actually owns Nifty's soul or not. In the pilot, she does appear in silhouette alongside Husk in this clip with Alistair and the other overlords. They even have the same red outline as him. But while we've seen Husk in chains before, as well as the subtle hatred he harbors for his Creole captor, Nifty and Alistair have a much different dynamic, almost behaving like a close yet creepy father and daughter at times. He humors her by laughing maniacally alongside her despite being visibly uncomfortable with it, and he's not only okay with her touching him, which he has a strict policy against for others, but he's hunky-dory with her just placing sticks and bugs on his head. You could even say that Nifty adopted some of his tendencies, like the idea of putting on a smile wherever she goes. She has a habit of calling him sir while showing no romantic interest in him, despite her obsession with bad boys, which implies an air of respect. She's also extremely camera shy, which I'm sure Alistair loves as well. Her face is just not made for TV and video, just like his, a match made in hell. So with all these loose scraps on the table, what exactly can we craft? How did Nifty end up the way she did, and how the heck did she wind up in cahoots with the radio demon of all people? Well, to start, let's turn back time as far as we can and try to predict Nifty's human life. 
I mentioned earlier that three pieces of evidence point to Nifty possibly being the child of native Japanese immigrants who came over to the US, making her a Nisei or second generation Japanese American. And if she died in the 1950s at age 22, her year of death could be anywhere between 1950 and 1959, putting her year of birth anywhere between 1928 and 1937. Now, I'm not gonna go full history lesson on you, but prior to the 1930s, first generation Japanese immigrants, known as Issei, were heavily discriminated against, stereotyped, and just treated like general garbage, which is obviously horrible. So, in an effort to bridge the gap and hopefully form stronger relations with US citizens, they started raising their children to adopt customs from both their native Japanese roots and the American culture of their new homeland. They even taught their kids to speak both fluent Japanese and English, something that Nifty is confirmed to be skilled at. Obviously, this prejudice didn't go away entirely and persisted for decades afterwards, with events like Japan entering World War II in 1940 fanning the flames of hatred and branding them as traitors to the country. If you want further context on just how awful it was for West Coast Japanese Americans post Pearl Harbor, I recommend researching Executive Order 9066. But do so at your own risk, because it's honestly terrible what they did to these people. And it wasn't until 1945 that Japanese Americans were finally allowed to return home. If we use Nifty's latest possible birth year of 1937, she might have had to deal with this order when she was between 5 to 10 years old. That wouldn't do a child's mental state any favors. In addition, the fact that Nisei like Nifty were forced to adhere to the standards of two different cultures on a regular basis was reported to be both extremely exhausting and stressful for them. Day after day, they were pressured to speak, eat, and adhere to Japanese standards in their households by demand of their families, while also following American customs during school time and social interactions. It's like they were torn between two different worlds at all times, with many Nisei believing that constantly bringing up the glaring differences between Japanese and American lifestyles only further tore both groups apart by emphasizing just how different they were at their cores. If Nifty grew up during this generation, I can imagine that things must have been extremely confusing and terrifying for her. But this was likely only half of her problems. If you look at the general zeitgeist of 1940s and 50s America, women weren't exactly given the most freedom. During both decades, women were encouraged and sometimes even forced to become the housewives, mothers, and homemakers of their families, being fed the importance of marrying at a very young age and having children as fast as they can. They definitely played a big part in the homeland work effort during the Second World War, but by the time the 50s rolled around, it was back to business of cooking and cleaning for most girls in the US. Now this upbringing of women is reflected perfectly in Nifty's tidy tendencies. Almost to a psychotic degree. Like, I know women were pushed to step forward into Stepford territory, but this behavior is like five steps above that. Almost as if she was pushed or is pushing herself way harder than most to uphold this mindset. And I think I might know why this is the case. When it comes to her character, Nifty is a very... wild kind of girl. She has no concept of personal space, she's extremely clingy to potential romantic partners, she chases after any bad boy that catches her eye regardless of their interest in her, she speaks her mind with no filter, and she's an absolute sucker for pain. If my assumptions of Nifty are right, then this shouldn't surprise anyone. Kids who grow up in ultra-strict, conservative households and periods tend to be absolute debauchery machines when they're given even a little freedom. After coming from a life where they're able to try nothing, they want to try everything and in major excess too. They gravitate towards people and things that are dangerous and rebellious, while forming these unique kinks and tendencies. When they are bullied or mistreated by society, they sometimes want to assert dominance on creatures lesser than them to feel some sort of power advantage, in the same way that Nifty takes her aggravation out on small, innocent bugs. Heck, the fact that she targets mama bugs specifically might show some repressed hatred of her parental figures. And while all of this makes for a funny fictional character to watch, in the real world, people like like this would likely struggle quite a bit in the social sphere, especially during Nifty's time. When Nifty started looking for potential partners, I imagine that she wasn't the most desirable pick for young bachelors. I mean, who do you think most guys in the 50s would go for? A girl who's very childish both in looks and behavior, very clingy, very needy, not very smart, with multiple out there interests and very creepy tendencies, or not that. It's not hard to imagine that Nifty wasn't exactly prime rib in the Delhi Isle of Dateable Dames. Heck, Vivzi even mentioned once that while Nifty is not a hopeless romantic, her love life would be extremely hopeless, which lines up with all of this really well. 
This would likely push Nifty to adopt the characteristics of a model wife even more than the average girl, to try and make up for the fact that guys in general are repulsed by her. Like, she may not be attractive, but she can at least fill those gaps by being extra useful. Right? So, when you combine all of these elements together, the traditionalist pressures of her Asian household, the pushy atmosphere of the time, the prejudice she faced on a daily basis, the fact that she was undesirable by the grand majority of dudes her age, when you pair all of this with the usual pressures that come with maturity and growing up, it's not hard to imagine that at one point, poor little Nifty just snapped. She absolutely lost her mind and started coming up with these weird, twisted assumptions about what's going on in her life. Maybe in a state of denial, she says to herself, Nifty, nifty, nifty. You're still not trying hard enough. You need to stop waiting for the boys to come to you and go right to the boys. You need to show them that you're the perfect wife. Then you'll be together forever. <laughs> <laughs> Heck, if you want my assumption for how she died, I imagine that she might have actually snuck into the house of a boy she really liked in the middle of the night and started forcibly cooking and cleaning for him, all dolled up in her cutest dress and caked up with makeup. Obviously the guy is terrified by this, and then one of two things could happen. Either her shenanigans end up setting the guy's house on fire, where he makes it out alive and Nifty burns to death in the blaze, which would make sense given that her introduction involves being pulled from a fire that she's immune to, or maybe the guy calls 911, the cops show up, and when Nifty tries to attack them, they shoot her three times in the chest and she bleeds out. The reason I say three times specifically is because in both her pilot design and redesign, her main outfits have three red dots on them. You could say this is a fashion choice, until you notice that the dots seem to be dripping and running, almost like they're blood-stained bullet holes or something. Might be a bit of a stretch, but I could totally see Nifty facing that kind of fate if she goes off the rails. After her little display of breaking and entering, stealing, and attempted murder, she of course ends up in hell and eventually meets up with Mr. Tall, Dark, and Scary himself. This could happen in multiple ways, but I imagine that when she initially plopped down in the fiery pits, the first thing that she hears are the screams of damned souls and wayward sinners echoing throughout the atmosphere, only to be followed by the suave, charismatic voice of a debonair, deadly demon lord. Yup, right away Nifty gets an earful of Alistair's radio show, and her bad boy lust immediately kicks in. She asks everyone on the street around her where that melodious voice is coming from, and someone tells her that it belongs to the radio demon. She grabs that person by the neck and says, Where? They say that his broadcast tower is over yonder, but they would not recommend stepping within 5,000 feet of it, for all that lies in that direction is pain and suffering. And Nifty didn't hear any of that as she's already sprinting full speed towards Big Al. In fact, if she did hear any of that, she probably just would have gone faster. She scales the tower with ease and completely interrupts Alistair mid-sentence. At first, he pays her no mind and maybe just uses one of his tendrils to kind of shoo her aside. But she keeps coming back again, and again, and maybe at one point even bites one of his tendrils like she was gonna do to Valentino in episode 6. Al eventually calls a commercial break and gives his full attention to Nifty. He threatens to kill her in a brutal way, but jokes on him, she's actually into that. You do realize I could crush your bones and spill your guts right now, you little nuisance. Don't threaten me with a good time, bad boy. <laughs> this gives Alistair pause as he slowly puts her down and takes a second to study her, seeing just how erratically and strangely she behaves. Maybe he sees her chase a bug around his little studio, constantly trying to stab it with reckless abandon. Maybe she follows it up the ceiling at one point and falls down onto the floor, cackling with glee and trying to fall down again, loving the pain. Then when she finally kills the bug, she offers it to Alistair as a present, like a girl would give a guy a flower or something. 
In this moment, Alistair's opinion of her changes from annoyance to amusement, and a little bit of pity, like he just found a lost puppy or something. This girl is clearly off her rocker, very naive, and from the smell of it, is also a recent entry into hell. If you read up on Alistair's standards and moral code like I did, you'd see that he essentially keeps people around that he finds entertaining, he is generally more polite and favorable towards women, he would make a better mentor figure to a child than a father, and his murderous mind is similar to that of the character character Dexter, where he mainly kills notorious criminals who make the conscious choice to do wrong. I imagine that all of these traits would come into play in regards to his dynamic with Nifty. Like I said before, Nifty is a lot more dim and childlike than most people her age, and her insanity definitely just made things worse. When Alistair looks at this girl, he knows that she must have gone to hell for a reason, but he questions if she fully knew what she was doing in the first place. Maybe she's just that far gone and acted on twisted assumptions and views of the world. They are technically choices that she made, but the choices came from an unwell mind. He's also seen a lot of abusive brutes during his time as a killer, and since he tends to be more forgiving of women, he might also assume that she was abused in some way, shape, or form when she was alive, which wouldn't be entirely wrong. It's extremely rare for Alistair to feel pity for anyone, especially during his early years before the hotel, but Nifty just ends up being the perfect storm for Alistair to feel even a small crack of humanity in his cold, cynical armor. Not to mention her ridiculous little escapades are quite the show, and would make for some unique memories if he kept her around. If he let her go about her business right now, she'd probably be squashed like an insect within the first 10 seconds of her being on her own, and he decides to not let that happen. He chooses to take Nifty under his wing as a protege and pet of sorts. He tells her that if she sticks by his side, she'll experience an entire realm of pain and bad boys and excitements beyond measure, which Nifty is all too excited to see for herself. And then from that day on, Nifty, under Alistair's supervision, and after all the pain and suffering she witnessed during her lifetime, can live out an existence of debauchery, temptation, and wish fulfillment with no strings attached or threat of danger. She even starts to look up to Alistair as a mentor figure, adopting a lot of his tendencies like the constant toothy smile he always comes fully dressed with. A bittersweet existence to be sure, but at least in the end she made some new friends, and ironically is now living in an environment that's way less painful than her old one. Yeah, imagine hell being the preferable option in any situation. Oh, and if you're wondering how this will line up with my old Rue theory, I imagine that Rue wouldn't really push Alistair to kill her and grab her soul, since one mortal soul isn't really worth much compared to what they're raking in at the moment. Like, if you compare Nifty to an overlord who has multiple souls under his belt, it'd be like eating a cherry tomato versus a full nine-course meal. Also, in her eyes, Nifty is more than likely gonna get herself killed anyway at some point, which would be really fun to watch. So, eh, let her live for now. What does one tiny, insignificant soul mean to the root of all eve? Wait a second. Okay, hear me out. Consider this for a moment. We've got two female hell dwellers with bright red hair and sharp toothy smiles. The tendrils on Rue take the shape of sharp, insect-like implements used to stab others with. Very similar to Nifty's affinity for sharp objects and her love of killing bugs. And both of them are greatly attached and fixated on evil, sinful individuals. To the point where Nifty feverishly chases after anyone she sees as bad and actively whines when a cruel person behaves kindly or changes sides. It's almost like an addiction as if there's an evil essence coursing through her veins that can often get the better of her. Now, if we stick to my theory that Rue is in a deal with Alistair, the only method of communication and observation that she has is tapping into his mind to either read his thoughts or telepathically tell him things. But what if she secretly created an extra tiny set of hands and an extra watchful eye to do everything she couldn't do on her own? She could see whatever she wants, go into whatever room she wants, and pick up and move anything she wants without the need to tap into someone. Maybe she's aware of the few small exceptions to Alistair's moral code and knows exactly what kind of person he wouldn't be suspicious of. All this time we've been watching Nifty scurry around, thinking she's two brain cells short of an internet meme, but maybe that's by design. Did Rue perfectly craft the most unassuming spy imaginable as a way to not only keep an extra eye on Alistair, but also manipulate a few things for her master plan behind Alistair's back in order to keep up her secret identity as the Loa without him knowing? Oh you all left a while ago.
Ah well, more important this conspiracy for me. So yeah, those are my thoughts on Nifty. She doesn't get much discussion in the fandom, cause honestly, what really is there to discuss? But it was pretty fun taking a deep dive into her character, and seeing what could really be bugging our little maid munchkin deep down. But with all that said, I want to hear what you guys think. Can you see Nifty having a truly dark and heartbreaking backstory at some point, or will she forever be a teeny tiny neat and tidy mystery? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in everybody, and I hope to see you all real soon.